Have you ever seen a movie that starts right in the middle of action? Like right when the movie starts, perhaps there's a soldier just running and there's explosions going off behind him and there's screams and gunshots and he's just running trying to avoid all this and then maybe he jumps into a foxhole and a grenade um, rolls right next to him and then the scene cuts and it says 20 years earlier or 10 years earlier and you're wondering like, what happens to him? Does the grenade blow up and kill him? Or is it a, is it a dud? Or does he grab it and throw it back or something? Um, and then how did he even get there? So you have to continue watching the movie to find out, you know, how did he get into this predicament? And what happens to him afterwards? Well, the cross is kind of like that. And a lot of believers, myself included, um, come into the faith with a message about the cross. You probably got saved, um, if you're saved, by uh, a message of the cross. Something along the lines of, you're a sinner in need of a savior, and Jesus died on the cross for your sins, right? And when we come into uh, God's story um, through the cross, which is not a bad thing, it's kind of like coming into uh, this story in the middle of the action. So we got to go back to the beginning of the story, to where God starts the story. Um, and I bet you know uh, a whole bunch of Bible stories like David and Goliath, um, Noah and the flood, uh, Daniel and the lion's den, um, Saul uh, and the, you know, the on the road to Damascus, um, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, on and on and on, right? You probably know um, a bunch of stories in the Bible. But where do they fit in in the big scheme of things, right? So in this video, I want to give framework. I want to give you framework and I want to give you um, context for all of those stories and for your story. Because God is telling a story and we have a role to play. But if we don't know his story, then how are we gonna know where we fit in, where our story fits in as the author of life, you know, tells his story throughout uh, redemptive history? What is God's redemptive plan? And um, we need to, you know, make sure that we understand his story that he's telling. So, that's what I want to do today. I want to look at, in this video, I want to look at a thread that weaves its way throughout the entire Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, from beginning to end, and, um, you know, just paint that backdrop for us. Um, so, of course, in the beginning, God created uh, everything, and including humans, and everything was good. And the humans were in the garden, they were in paradise, and they had perfect communion with God. You know, it was unbroken, and they were going to live forever. God created them to live for eternity. But then a serpent come, comes along and tempts them, and they agree with the temptation, and they give in, and they rebel against God, and decided to be disobedient to God's one commandment that he gave them, and uh, in doing so, sin entered the world, right? And through sin, death entered, and then everything that once was became fractured, right? There was harmony and peace, and all that became broken. And um, then we see God give this prophecy shortly after what theologians call the fall, Right, I believe even the Bible, uh, that if you have like title headings in your Bible, it will say the fall, right? Because it's the fall of mankind, the fall of humanity. And shortly after that happens, um, God gives us this prophecy, the first gospel, if you will. Theologians uh, refer to it as the mother of all prophecies. And it's in Genesis 3.15, and this is God talking to the serpent. And uh, this is what he says. And I will put 
enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so God is saying that he's going to um, create conflict between the serpent, which is Satan, the devil, his offspring, the woman, and her offspring. So there's going to be conflict between God and his followers and Satan and his followers. And then there's this mysterious he that is brought up into the picture. It says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so this is a prophecy about the Messiah. This is the promised one, right? The coming seed that will crush the head of Satan and his followers. And I want to read 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 real quick. Because I, I believe it just fits really well right here. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Okay? So, we have this promise this prophecy in Genesis 3.15. And throughout the entire Bible, throughout the rest of um, God's story that's unfolding throughout history, um, this prophecy is built upon. We get uh, more details about it as the story unfolds and we get more clarity. Uh, for example, let me read uh, Genesis Chapter 22, verse 18. God is talking to Abraham and he says, actually, let me start in um, verse 17. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring... All nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay, so through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. So first, this promise is through Eve's seed, right? It's going to be a descendant of Eve. And now we come to find out, we learn that, okay, now it's continuing down the line of descendants. And this promise, once again, is given but to Abraham right? See, it's being built upon. But now we learn that all nations will be blessed through this seed, this promised coming seed, which is, you know, through the offspring of Abraham. All nations on earth will be blessed, okay? And now I want to read Genesis chapter six, or chapter 26, verse 4. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. Okay, so it's pretty much the same thing. But this time, I believe it's to Isaac, which is Abraham's son. So God reiterates the promise um, and now it's to Isaac. Okay, and then let's look at 2 Samuel. So this would kind of be considered as the... Uh, Abrahamic covenant, okay? It's a promise given to Abraham through, from God, and it totally just depends on God. It doesn't matter what Abraham does. He has nothing. It, like, God is going to handle this promise. He's going to make sure that it is fulfilled. It's not like the Mosaic covenant, which has ifs and thens, right? If you obey, then you will take possession of the land, you will prosper, you will be blessed, right? Um, but if you disobey, then you won't be blessed. You'll be cursed, and I will send plague and famine and sword against you, and you will be scattered and kicked out of the land. Okay, that's the Mosaic Covenant. This is the Abrahamic Covenant, and it is built upon that first original prophecy and promise in Genesis 3.15, now it's the Abrahamic covenant, okay? And we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse uh, 
12 and 13. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Okay, so now we learn that this mysterious head crusher, this mysterious he, which, uh, you know, is the promised Messiah, the coming one, the coming seed from Genesis 3.15. Now we learn that he's going to be a king. Okay, and this is um, what's considered the Davidic covenant. Okay, this is a promise um, to David from God that one from David's line will... Um, reign and rule forever. He'll sit on the throne of David and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Okay, so you could see how this is, uh, this seed, this promised Messiah, uh, we're getting more details and clarity. Like through him, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And now, okay, he's a king and he's going to, his kingdom is going to last forever. Um, but now I want to go back to the theme of um, he will crush your head. This idea of, of him being a head crusher. Okay, I want to zero in on that thread that is weaved all throughout the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And so we're going to look at the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17. Okay, so Genesis 3.15 said he will crush your head. Now let's look at Numbers 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the sons of Sheth. Okay, so you see, there it is again. He will crush the foreheads of Moab. And now we're actually getting names of Satan's followers, who God's enemies are. Uh, it's the sons of, of Sheth and, um, you know, the, the Moabites, if I pronounce that right. Okay, so it's being built upon. Now let's look at Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verse 21 says this, Surely God will crush the heads of of his enemies, the hairy crowns of those who go on in their sins. Okay, hold up a sec. Wasn't it a descendant of Eve? Wasn't it Eve's seed, and then Abraham, and then Isaac's? Now it says, God, surely God will crush the heads of his enemies, the hairy crowns of those who go on in their sins. So now is this this promised seed, this Messiah, this coming one, is he God now all of a sudden? You see how it's being uh, built upon? Now let's look at Psalm 110, verse 5 and 6. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead, and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. Okay, so there it is again. This coming head crusher. He will judge the nations. Now we learn that he's going to judge the nations. And then he's going to crush kings on the day of his wrath. Now let's look at Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 13. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. And I believe some translations, or maybe in the original language, I think it says you stripped him from tail to head, which would invoke the language of the serpent. It would, you know point back to Genesis 3.15. But so, this coming seed, this promised Messiah, is a head crusher. And you can see how we're working our way through, and we're getting more details, more clarity. It's being built upon. We're working our way through 
history and, and the Bible. Now let's look at uh, Romans 16, verse 20 real quick. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Okay, so now it's, you know, it's the God of peace. You will soon crush Satan under your feet. Okay, so now we're going to look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 through 17. And like I said, this video is just to paint the backdrop, just to give you context and framework to understand what is the big story. What is God's big story that our stories fit into and that all the other stories that we know about in his word how do they fit into this bigger context? We need to understand this uh, so that we can interpret um, the Bible correctly and so that we can play our roles correctly. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 13, says, When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Man, there's a lot packed in this verse. So from verse 9 in Revelation chapter 12, we learn that the dragon is the devil. Okay, I'll read verse 9 for you real quick. Uh, the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Okay, so here in verse 13, when it says... When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, this is talking about Satan, okay? This is the devil or, you know, the ancient ser serpent, whatever you want to call him. And then he pursued the woman, and the woman in here in Revelation chapter 12 is Israel, okay? That language is used a lot throughout the Bible. God, um, you know, is a husband to Israel. And then you'll read verses that Israel, you know, she did this or her, you know, that language of, of Israel being a woman is used a lot throughout the Bible. And of course, the male child is Jesus because Jesus is a descendant um, from Israelites. He came out of the nation of Israel. So that's how the woman Israel gave birth to the male child Jesus. Verse 14. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half a time out of the serpent's reach. So that's three and a half years. A year, two years, and a half a year. And then because of the book of Daniel, we know that this is the last three and a half years at the end of the age. Um... So that's the context right here. This is the last three and a half years during the Great Tribulation. Um, Israel is going to be a massive refugee crisis uh, because the Antichrist and his armies, you know, his armed forces, his troops are going to invade the land of Israel and they will uh, be scattered into the desert, right, into other surrounding nations and, and countries looking for refuge. But a lot of them, according to the book of uh, Zechariah, are going to be killed, slain within the city, and captive. Zechariah uh, chapter 14. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Okay, so the dragon is sending his, his army, his troops after Israel. And it seems like something supernatural happens here. God protects his remnant, his, his uh, chosen remnant of the, the people of Israel, right? He, he protects them somehow. Verse 17, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and he went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. So there it is again, that word offspring. Uh, and you see the whole story uh, is God and his followers, God and his people are at conflict with Satan and his followers. And it's not just ethnic 
descendants. It's actual, actually a spiritual thing that we see, see right here. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Who's the rest of her offspring? Who's the rest of Israel's offspring? Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So that would be Christians. So Satan and his followers, you know, with the Antichrist as the leader, is attacking Israel, going after Israel, and he can't destroy them all because God is keeping a remnant for himself, and he gets enraged, and then he goes and makes war against the rest of Israel's offspring, which would be us Christians, right? Because we, we obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So he, he goes off to make war against uh, Christians because he can't touch uh, God's remnant. And he's, he's frustrated about that. And so, you know, we, Abraham is the father of faith, right? And if we by our faith have been saved through grace, then we are children of Abraham, the father of faith. Um, you know, we've been adopted in by God's grace into this family of faith, and now we are citizens with Israel, so we are spiritual children, the same way Jesus calls the Pharisees children of the devil, right? He calls Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, you guys are children of your father, the devil, and that's in... Um, the book of John chapter 8, okay? So um, we see here that the whole story of God is a uh, conflict between him and his people and Satan and his people. But there is a coming seed, this promised head crusher, which we know is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's going to eventually come and crush the head of Satan. He's going to destroy the Antichrist and his armies, and then he's going to establish his messianic kingdom and reign over the earth from Jerusalem. And that is the big story. That is God's redemptive plan to redeem um, you know, his original plan that we messed up back in the garden. He's going to restore paradise, restore the garden, restore, um, you know, that unbroken face-to-face -face communion with God. Okay, so this is the big picture story. This is framework and context that our stories fit into.